The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Introducing Sign Institute Fellow 2022, Shannon Watts. This is uh, the first after two sessions online of being in person. Um, and it's a much different experience to be on campus and get to see the beautiful campus here at American University. Um, usually I'm sitting at my house uh, outside of San Francisco and uh, doing these just sort of looking at a screen and no people. So it's a much uh, better and more interactive experience, but grateful for everyone who tuned in today online for joining us. Um, today we're talking about elections and, and uh, we're handing out copies of my book this time, I'm sure we will next time too, if we have some more. The book is Fight Like a Mother. And really what I wanted to do with the book is to uh, put down on paper how I started along with so many other brilliant people, Moms Demand Action and and how we did it, but also how we work as an organization. And so that's how I've broken out these seminars as well. Um, We focus on on three different tacks. The first being um, legislative work, So we talked about that in in the first session. Um, The other being uh, electoral work, which we're talking about today. Uh, The first session, if if you can go back and watch it, I think it's valuable because we talked about how do you tell your story, which is a really big part of all of this. But so legislative work, electoral work, and then the next uh, meeting, which is April uh, 8th, I believe, will be focusing more on um, the cultural side of this. And so those are really three legs of a stool. Um, And so talked a lot about a legislative piece. I'll I'll probably touch on that a little bit more today. Um, But the the electoral part of this work is incredibly valuable. Okay, the thing is not moving. There we go. Um, And here you see so many students. I love this photo of our Students Demand Action volunteers. Um, We're gonna talk about the objectives today. So elections matter at every cycle and at every level. If you learn nothing else in the next hour or so, please take that away from this discussion, that it isn't just about federal electoral cycles. It's about cycles up and down the ballot, everything from sheriff uh, to county coroner to uh, school board members to city council members, obviously your state house, but every single election cycle matters. And too often we just focus on that four-year federal cycle. Um, I'm going to talk today about the history of the movement strategy around electoral politics that has evolved quite a bit. Uh, What was it like to work on elections in those early days? You have to keep in mind, uh, we took on one of the most powerful wealth and special interests that's ever existed. And we were a much smaller group of of mostly moms at the beginning. And and that was certainly an interesting experience. Um, What we're like today, How are we doing this work now that we are one of the largest grassroots movements in the whole country um, with sophisticated technology and get out the vote capabilities? What are some of the winning strategies that you can take away and learn? Whether you have decided to become a campaign manager, which I would very much encourage you to get involved in if you like politics. Um, In fact, I'm gonna keep plugging Students Demand Action Um, I'm really hopeful someone will start a chapter here, but we do have Students Demand Action chapters in the DC area. And when you get involved in Students Demand Action, you can then get involved in something I'll talk about more today, which is Demand a Seat. And that is our new program to train 
people of all ages to run for office or to be campaign managers. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion today with two elected officials from the state of Virginia, and they can talk to you from a state that has really made a lot of changes in the last decade, uh, especially around the issue of gun safety. And then, as always, we'll follow up uh, with what next steps and ways you can learn about electoral politics on your own. So let's start with the history of the gun violence prevention movement. And if you were uh, at my last session, I talked a lot about how the NRA went from an organization that really was focused on um, so-called sportsmanship, right? Hunting, fishing, gun safety, training. It really was the bread and butter of that organization since its inception over 100 years ago. But then there was something called the Cincinnati Revolt in the 1970s, where a group of um, essentially extremists, right-wing gun owners who decided that they really wanted the NRA to be a lobbying organization to fight against any gun laws that were trying to put in place that might limit in any way um, their access to guns. And, and felt really that the Constitution was sort of this God-given right to have a gun anywhere, anytime, for anyone, no questions asked. Uh, if you go back to 2012, and again, for me, everything is before the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy and after. And really, that is when the gun violence prevention move ch movement changed in this country. So if you go back to 2012, the NRA had amassed so much power and so much wealth. They were truly um, the, again, the most powerful special, uh, wealthy special interest that's ever existed. And they had an A rating, right? So you could get rated by the NRA, A through F, and everyone, every lawmaker really wanted an A. And in fact, even Democrats really wanted an A because it felt that they showed their bona fides, especially in rural areas. And so if you go back to when President Obama was elected in 2008, about a quarter of all Democrats in Congress had an A rating from the NRA. Uh, the NRA was seen as being formidable, that you could never go up against them, that if you did, that they would make sure you got primary, no matter which party you were in. And there was just really this fear. Many would say they were a paper tiger because simultaneously their return on investments and election cycles were dwindling. But it, what, it didn't matter because they built up this reputation um, of, of really being uh, an organization that you should be fearful of going against. NRA members, right? Now we can debate whether the NRA really has 5 million members or not. Um, in order to become an NRA member, often it just means you bought a gun. And so they sign you up when you buy the gun, you bought a magazine, you bought some kind of paraphernalia, they sent you something in the mail and you wanted a magazine discount. So you signed up for the NRA. Um, there have been media that have reported on this and they have said, look, we don't think the NRA has 5 million members. We think they're claiming people who aren't alive. They're claiming people who are just on their rolls. So then you juxtapose that with where was the gun violence prevention movement in 2012? And when you look at it, you hear the phrase intensity gap a lot, just meaning that this wasn't something that was getting people to the polls. Yes, there had been some mass shootings in this country. Um, sure, it was an issue you know, that may have impacted someone through suicide in their family, or there was an episode of gun violence in their community. But when people were going to the polls, they were really focused on education, jobs, and the economy. Right, those were the, the top three issues for so, so long. And getting people to be outraged and then turn that into some kind of action, whether it's a demand for legislation or a demand for different representatives, uh, that was a struggle. And then there were really great funding issues uh, for our side uh, of, the, of the movement. I, I went into this last time in the last session, but, but the bottom line was there, were, there, there weren't really the big philanthropic funders for this work that's needed. Um, and, and when you don't have money, it is difficult to organize. Um, we spend, as an organization, tens of millions of dollars just organizing volunteers every single year. So it is an expensive proposition. And if you don't have the money, then you aren't going to be able to create a grassroots that works. Um, and so that's why we did not have a grassroots movement, really. 
Uh, when I started Moms Demand Action, you know, I, I told the story at the very first session, but I, I had grown up as a teen in the 80s when Mothers Against Drunk Driving was so incredibly influential. And you saw this group of really angry moms sort of change the culture, change the laws uh, within just a decade. Um, I can remember going to high school and there would be a car out front of my high school and it, it still had blood on it. And it was, this is what happens when you drink and drive. This is the implication. And I thought, you know, I was sitting in my house in Indiana the day after the Sandy Hook school shooting. And I thought there has to be this for the issue of gun safety. This has to exist, I'm going to join it. And so I went online and what I found was that there was not a grassroots movement. There were think tanks, there were uh, one-off state and city organizations, all of which I must say were mostly run by men. I knew I wanted to be part of a pissed off group of women. That's who I've seen get so much done in my lifetime. Um, and so that needed to be created. So as I mentioned in 2008, about a quarter of all Republicans had A ratings from the NRA. They were voting with the NRA in Congress. Um, and this, they, they hadn't felt enough pressure to go up against the NRA. And it's also important to remember that back in 2012, when I started Moms in Action, states like Pennsylvania, Colorado, Virginia, and, and, and they've swung back and forth, with the exception, I would say, of Colorado. But they were very solid red swing states, right? Like these were states that, that sometimes swung, but for the most part, they were very red. Um, and, and so as you, you know, as we move forward a decade, that certainly has changed quite a bit. So I, I want to talk more about this on the next slide post Sandy Hook, but, but keep in mind that the NRA, it, it, what incites fear in lawmakers is when the NRA says they're going to score them. So what the NRA does is they, they're basically keeping track of you and they're going to hold you accountable. There will be penalties, there will be consequences if you vote in a way they don't agree. And one of the most controversial things they did was to start scoring votes in the Supreme Court on those nominees. They did not want Sotomayor, they did not want Kagan. And the reason is because they knew they were on the side of gun safety. And so this is the first time that the NRA scores SCOTUS nominations. And we'll get, we'll get some more of that, how that really changed the landscape of politics in this country on the issue of guns. But after the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy, uh, you may remember that Senators Manchin and Senators Toomey, Senator Toomey came together and they created a background checks bill. This was essentially a bipartisan piece of legislation that was quite timid in its aspirations. It was simply to require a background check on every handgun sale. And that didn't even include transfers between family members. This just meant we're going to take the existing system that requires a background check on licensed gun sales, and we're going to apply it to unlicensed gun sales, right? You buy a gun at a gun show. You buy a gun online and you make an in-person transaction. You buy a gun at a garage sale, there should be a background check. Background check system works great. Why not expand it? Well, that vote failed by six votes. And that, that piece of legislation failed by six votes in 2013. I can remember sitting in the Senate gallery when it happened. Um, and, and what I remember most about it is that there's a woman named Pat Mache, if you've heard of Pat. And Pat took down the gunman um, outside the Safeway in Tucson, Arizona, when Gabby Giffords and, and several others were, were shot. She took him down. This is a woman who, you know, at the time, I think was in her 60s, right? Just, and, and this big, like just took him down at the knees. And so she was sitting in the Senate gallery across the way from me. And she began screaming shame, shame on those lawmakers. And do you know what they did? They dragged her out of the Senate gallery. They gave her a background check and they arrested her. So it was an interesting time. So that this fight then plays out in 2014 elections, right? This fight around gun safety, there's this burgeoning movement. There's still this incredible anger um, around what happened at Sandy Hook, the fact that nothing was done by our federal government. Now keep in mind in the states, they were doing things. State lawmakers were doing things, but we decided we needed to hold lawmakers accountable who didn't do the right thing. And one of those lawmakers 
was Senator Kelly Ayotte in New Hampshire. She was the only Republican on the Eastern Seaboard to vote against background checks. And so we felt, even though she was Republican, she was a mom, she was a woman, she was in a, a blue state, we would hold her accountable. And, and we did, she lost her seat. But then there were lawmakers who the NRA went in and, and they had done what the NRA wanted. They had voted against background checks, Republicans, thinking the NRA would have their back. Guess what? The NRA went in and voted for their Republican opponent. So Mark Pryor, for example, was a Senator in the state of Arkansas. He voted against background checks. He was considered himself to be on the right side of the issue. The, Republic, or the NRA went in and invested heavily in Tom Cotton, who is a Senator today. So I really think that was an important lesson for Democrats. And the lesson is with friends like the NRA, you need enemies. If you're gonna do what they ask you to do, and then they're gonna oppose you publicly and they're gonna spend a whole lot of money to make sure you lose, you can vote your conscience. You can do what you actually wanna do, what your constituents actually want you to do. And there won't be necessarily a consequence. Now, that only works. You can only vote your conscience and keep your job if there is a grassroots movement that has your back and can make sure that you keep your job, right? So flash forward a decade and Really, if you look at polls, the, the NRA is way out of sync with mainstream America. And if you oppose background checks, if you have an A rating from the NRA, and let's be clear, if you have an A rating from the NRA, it means you oppose removing guns from domestic abusers, you oppose red flag laws, you oppose a background check on all gun sales, uh, you oppose the permitting system. There are so many things that that's out of touch with mainstream America by having that A rating from the NRA. And in fact, What's interesting is that the NRA realized that, um, especially during the 2018 election cycle, which is when we flipped the house, um, that they actually took all that data down. They took all their ratings down. We had saved it all because we had been keeping track of it and we put it all right back up. So people were very clear on who had A's and who had S from the NRA. Um, as I mentioned, the NRA for a long time has had a diminishing return on elections. So they were investing in elections, but they weren't getting the outcome they wanted really until Donald Trump, which is what they wanted, but, but that's an interesting story too. But, but if you look at their track record on elections, they're in many ways a paper tiger. They talk a big game, they're people afraid of being primary because of them, but, but their investment election hasn't been great. The other thing that's interesting that's happened in the last decade is that the base has moved to the right. So much like the, the Tea Party moved Republicans to the right, gun extremists, so every single state in this country has some version of the NRA that is to the right of the NRA. So when, if you live in Colorado, there's a group called the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. If you live in Ohio, there's the Ohio Buckeyes. There's all these different local gun groups that pull the NRA to the right. And in turn, if you look at the issue right now in this country, if you look at all of the issues that are bubbling up right now, whether it's CRT, uh, whether it's book bans, whether it's um, transgender kids, permitless carry is also one of those issues, right? So it's become sort of this policy anchor of the very, very right base. If you look at our movement, I mean, we have come just such a long way in just 10 years. And I know 10 years seems like a long amount of time. And trust me, as a full-time volunteer, it is. However, if you look at it in the microcosm of what is a social movement, how long does it take to create change? It isn't a long time, right? To get every woman in this country, not just white women, the right to vote, it's over a century. So 10 years, I think, in what we've accomplished is pretty outstanding and, and amazing. And the, you know, the fact that we represent the mainstream American right now, we aren't anti-gun, we're not against the Second Amendment, we simply want to restore the responsibility to go along with gun rights. And that includes background checks, and that includes safety training. Um, we're well-funded now, thanks to major philanthropic uh, donors like Mike Bloomberg, who really has you know, given our organization hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, uh, people like the Bombers, we have so many wonderful donors who this is one of their main issues now. And, and that enables us to organize our grassroots, to have a legal team that, that fights this in the courts, 
um, to have a comms team, to um, have a policy team, to do all the things that we need to do to make sure we are constantly moving the ball forward. And then really an important, and, and we now have over 8 million supporters. And you might remember that figure I just said a minute ago, which is the NRA that says claims to have five. So we're larger than the NRA now, and we can get out the vote. We can knock doors, we can make calls, we can make a real difference when it comes to holding people accountable. Uh, we have a saying as an organization, and that is, if you do the right thing, we'll have your back. If you do the wrong thing, we'll have your job. And that only works if you have people that can actually make it happen. So I mentioned Harry Reid, or I, I mentioned um, the Supreme Court justices a minute ago and why it was so important that the NRA decided to score those nominations, those nominees for the first time. So Senator Harry Reid was one of those Democrats who had an A rating from the NRA. And he was ideologically along with them, but they started to become more extreme and he sort of stayed in the middle. And so for him, that was a turning point. When, when the NRA said, we're gonna score you, Harry Reid, if you vote for these, nominees, and, and so many others did too, um, you know, that's where we we're going to have to part ways now. And so this was really an ideological turning point because there were Democrats um, who wanted to have the NRA on their side, and you know, that includes Bob Casey, Joe Donnelly, uh, Martin Heinrich, Joe Manchin, John Tester, Pat Toomey, Mark Warner. These were all senators with A ratings from the NRA who then had to make a decision. And it was because they saw this grassroots movement growing on the side they wanted to be on on this issue, they were free to finally part ways with the NRA. And on top of that, you know, we just started, as I mentioned, we had finally had funding. So you know, we were able to create a grassroots movement. Um, we, our organization is the largest grassroots movement in the country. We have chapters in every single state. We have local groups in cities. Um, we are very sophisticated about our advocacy, and we can get out the vote in every single election cycle. And, and, and it's really important to remember that, you know, school boards matter, city council seats matter, state house seats matter, so we can play in all of that. Uh, the other thing that has been, a, I think, a really important um, movement forward is that we are seeing gun safety become a major policy concern among voters. Uh, and we're gonna talk more about Virginia, but in 2019, we were able to flip both chambers of the General Assembly in Virginia, mostly on this issue. This was a top three voting issue in exit polls uh, because the elections were soon after the Virginia Beach shooting, because lawmakers did absolutely nothing. Um, and so this more and more is becoming a major issue and particularly among women, and then also particularly among women of color. Polling shows the A ratings are political liability. I don't know if you've seen any lawmakers, particularly in Congress, wearing their F button. They're very proud of their F rating from the NRA now, which is something that, that I think our organization has had a hand in. Um, we outspent the NRA. For the, it's the first time they were outspent in the history of the movement in 2018. And as a result, we flipped the, the house that year, um, our volunteer, Lucy McBath, who is a gun violence survivor, was elected to Congress. She's still a member of Congress. She's uh, running her third race right now. And uh, it was just such an important year to show that you could hold people accountable on the issue of gun safety and win. Now, as I mentioned, so many different things are changing. I'm not sure I could have ever predicted that guns would become such an issue for this right wing that has sprung up and it's been really emboldened and inflamed by the Trump presidency. Um, we know that that was a big issue for Donald Trump, the Second Amendment and for his supporters, um, that his son is very involved in the NRA and in fact marketed silencers. And so, you know, the more uh, that that becomes an issue that is part of the base, it's going to require different tactics and strategies around how do you get mainstream voters, many of whom are gun owners, to vote on the right side of this issue. And, and you know, this is a very vocal minority. 
And what we need is to not have a silent majority, but a, a very vocal majority as well. So I think it'll be it'll be shaped by COVID. Record number of gun sales in the last two years, tens and tens of millions of guns sold. Some estimate over 50 million to new gun owners. Um, and that demographic looks increasingly like it is people of color and women. Um, messaging around crime. You're already seeing Republicans talking about or running on the fact that crime is increasing. And yet, why is crime increasing? It's actually gun crime is increasing, right? So robbery, rape, things like that are, are stagnant or going down. It is gun crime. It is gun deaths that are going up. That is the logical outcome of laws that have been passed by mostly Republicans over the last decade. So Democrats have to get good around messaging on this issue. Um, and then changing demographics. You know, it, the, the nation will look much different in 10 years. I think the question is where will the next generation stand on the issue of guns and, and will they be overwhelmingly gun owners? Will they be angry because they're also the lockdown generation? We don't really know the answer to that yet. So here's how we've evolved as an organization. You know, we have held lawmakers accountable. As I said, you know, do the right thing and we'll have your back. Do the wrong thing and we'll have your job. Um, we worked hard to marry legislative and electoral goals. We are trying to pass legislation. We are ourselves in many ways scoring votes, who is with us, who is against us. And then we are holding them accountable at election time through advertising, through po political spending, through grassroots power. Um, and, and that's mirroring money with grassroots. Um, and then, as I mentioned, demand a seat. Uh, but I want to break in here because I think we have uh, one of our delegates on the line. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So if you don't mind, uh, can you just introduce yourself um, to our class and to everyone watching? Uh, thank you. So I am uh, Senator Jennifer McClellan, representing the 9th District here in uh, Richmond, Virginia, which is basically the uh, capital and surrounding area. I have been in the Senate uh, since 2017 after spending 11 years in the House and have loved every minute. I'm a mom of two, uh, a wife, and a lawyer. Thank you, Senator. Delegate Bourne? Sure. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, I am Jeff Bourne. I'm the uh, delegate for the 71st district, which is wholly with the exception of about maybe 12 or 15 houses, uh, wholly comprised in the city of Richmond. Uh, I've been in the house since 2017. Um, I was uh, elected and then reelected to the Richmond City School Board. Uh, like Jen, I'm a lawyer. Like Jen, I'm a parent of two. Um, and just happy to be here. <laughs> well, we're happy you're here. So I would love also for you to tell us your stories, um, how you got involved in politics in the first place. And uh, Delegate uh, Bourne, since you're up on the screen, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I kind of came to politics or public policy, public service, um, kind of by happenstance. Um, when I was a, a student at William & Mary, I was an economics major and just knew I was going to be an investment banker and retire by the time I was 40. Um, that has not happened. Um, uh, we passed that We passed that exit a lot, uh, you know, several years ago. Um, but in, in one of the summers, I, I wanted to find something interesting to do, something different. Uh, and so I got hooked up with um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee from Houston, Texas. Uh, and I was a Okay, I think we've lost uh, the the audio for Delegate Bourne. Service. Oh, there he is. Oh. We lost you for a second. We got you back. So we, we heard where, you got hooked up with Sheila Jackson and then and then we lost you. Yeah, so I was her Congressional Black Caucus intern. Uh, and really within the first week, a couple of days, um, I knew that public policy, public service was really what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and so after graduating college, I uh, worked for the Sierra Club in Washington, D.C., then um, was, was honored to and humbled to have been chosen as deputy policy director for Mark Warner when he ran for governor, went back to law school. So my, my entire, most of my professional career has been in public service. And then when I had, we had our first child, I, and she was four and getting ready to enter public schools. And I said, what can I do? Um, 
in the next step of, of my service to, to my community, and it was to run for the school board because I think um, our schools and public education are the, are the foundation upon which all the other issues and priorities we have are built. Uh, so I ran and won, and, and then um, I guess the rest, as they say, is, is proverbial history. I'm here at the House of Delegates. Senator, how about you? How did you get involved? So uh, similar to Jeff, it was, you know, not my original plan to run for office. Um, I got interested in politics when I was a kid, uh, listening to my parents who were, were older. They both grew up during the Depression uh, under Jim Crow and sort of listening to them tell their stories um, and my own love of history, I came to understand that at its best, government as a force for solving problems, uh, responding to crisis, uh, which they saw through the New Deal, but at its worst as a form of oppression. So at 11, I decided I want to be a part of making government that force for good, but I didn't really know what that meant. So my dream job was to be a lawyer to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be a lawyer, I'll make money, I'll get married, I'll have kids, I'll retire, and then maybe one day I'll run for office, kind of like Jeff. But while I was in law school, Republicans took over and I didn't really want to work for them. So mm -hmm. I went into private practice and the entire time was very active with young Democrats and getting involved in campaigns. And my delegate uh, ran for Lieutenant Governor um, back in 2005. And the more I started to think about it and the more my friends talked to me, I realized, you know, I want to be the one making laws and voting and, and making the change and not just electing other people and hope that that they make it for me. So I ran and then I got married and then I had kids and uh, the rest is history for me as well. And Senator, you, you've watched politics in Virginia change so much, I would say, in the last 10 to 20 years, which is what I've been lecturing a little bit about, which is you know, Virginia used to be a solidly red state. You know, Mark Warner had an A rating from the NRA. He voted with them on, on a lot of different issues until we created this grassroots movement that really put pressure on lawmakers to be on the right side of this issue. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen play out? Is, has that been your experience and, and, and what have you seen? It, it has. Um, I, I think, you know, Politics is cyclical. So when I was a kid and first got interested, um, we we did have Democratic governors and a Democratic General Assembly, and then it shifted uh, to be you know pretty solidly Republican for both. When I got elected, it was a Republican General Assembly, and Mark Mark uh, Tim Kaine came in as governor when I got elected. So it was more divided government, but. What I have seen is that when, whatever the movement is, whether it's addressing gun violence, whether it's addressing reproductive health, Medicaid expansion, when there is a grassroots mobilization and pressure, then the policy moves. Um, otherwise, it's usually very slow and incremental, um, but I've seen when people show up and tell their stories in particular of how legislation, how legislative action or inaction affects their lives and their communities, that that tends to move legislators, you know, and frankly, governors a lot more effectively than just, you know, statistics and policy arguments at sort of a high level. So every time, you know, and that was definitely true when um, there was a huge grassroots momentum in response to the election of Donald Trump that led to the Democrats taking back over the House and the Senate. Uh, we had already had the governor's mansion. Um, and for two years, we really made generational change. And Delegate Bourne, has that been your experience as well? I mean, have you, have you interacted, for example, with Students Demand Action and Moms Demand Action volunteers? Do you feel like, you know, that makes a difference on, on uh, not just legislation, but the election cycles as well. We can't hear on mute. <laughs> Sorry. See, if this had been during, if, if this had been last year, the year before, I would have been 
my my Zoom skills would have been on point, but we've been in person, so I'm a little rusty right now. Um, I, I yeah, absolutely. I think Sarah McClellan hits the nail on the head, and I think just to 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 sort of add to it and put a finer point on it. Um, one, you know, when you have the grassroots um, mobilization and and engagement, um, it makes our jobs as lawmakers, as policymakers, easier, even in the face of adversity like this session. Um, I know Jen probably had a little bit different experience, uh, you know, at least early on before her bills came over to the House. But but in the House, it, it, it really was um, emotionally taxing, mentally draining um, to be in the minority and to see efforts to roll back all the generational and transformational progress that we had made. But knowing that we had groups like Moms Demand Action, Students Demand Action, um, pick your stakeholder group that supports all the changes that we've made, the progress that we've made. It makes us, it, it, it inspires us and it energizes us to continue to fight even in the face of, of those sort of uh, in seemingly insurmountable odds. Well, and, and Delegate, we talked about this before you jumped on, but you know, for four years, we had a governor and, and um, a general assembly that supported gun safety that was working hard to pass new and innovative laws and, and did over pass over a dozen of them. Uh, we know that the, the outcome of the last election, which swung from being focused on gun violence prevention to education, um, uh, particularly in light of COVID, now you're in the minority. So what does that, what is the experience of, of having a governor who is on a different, on a different side of those issues? What, what's it like um, to be on defense? Um, you know, I, I, I think um, fortunately, well, I guess, unfortunately, but fortunately, um, both Jen and I have had experience in the minority as well as the majority. And I think um, what my experience in the minority has taught me is there's still opportunity for progress. There's still opportunity to make things happen, um, especially when you think about both chambers being so closely divided. Um, there are certainly those handful of issues, and I think gun violence reduction is one of those where um, positions are very deeply held, and um, there's not much room um, or willingness to to negotiate or compromise. Uh, and so when you when you give as much as Jen and I do to the job and you have to receive the calls and meet with the families and hear the tragedies about gun violence and how it grips our communities or how the public education system which, which the Republicans um, had been in charge of for 20 years, for a generation, is failing our kids. Um, it's very, it's, it's emotionally taxing. And, and, but, you know, I think knowing that we're on the right side of the issue, knowing that you know, better days are going to come, and knowing that um, we have, as as uh, as has been said, a great crowd of witnesses with us. Um, you know, it, it it again, it energizes us. It 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 helps us fight, and it helps us work as hard as we do to try and protect that progress, make more progress. Um, but it is much different, and it you know, um, it's it's painful because I. I I don't like to sit there and, and fight hard, even knowing what the outcome is going to be on a gun violence reduction bill or, you know, a pro environment bill or a pro public education bill. When you know, you press your button, you look up on the board, and it's going to be fifty two to forty eight in the house. Well, and and you know, you bring up an important point, which is offense is great, but so often um, what lawmaking and, and activism are about is playing defense, and so. Senator, I would ask you that question. You know, we're in a new um, administration in Virginia, and I know that you've had success in uh, helping to make sure the gun safety bills that we passed over a dozen, you know, in the last four years, stayed intact. There were efforts to roll them back. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think you know, first. Um, you know, Jeff had the benefit of, of being here with a, a Democratic governor. Um, I have been in a position where I've been in the minority with a Republican governor before. So I think I knew a little bit more what to expect, but I also have the benefit of, of in the Senate being in the majority. 
So uh, that, that brings a couple of things. You know, first, I learned very early on in my career that all of our political beliefs and how we vote is based on our life experiences, our perspective, and what we know. So it became critical for me to meet people where they are to understand why they believe what they believe, even if I don't agree with them, and, and to push to share my perspective with them. So perfect example of this, um, the, the, the one bill that is still in conference, you know, technically, even though we've adjourned, we're coming back for a special session and we had about a half a dozen bills that were carried over to that special session. One is a bill to create the um, Virginia Center for Firearm Violence Inter and Intervention Prevention. The one area where there's common ground with Republicans and Democrats is we need to work to prevent gun violence by addressing the root cause. But that means something very different to me and to Jeff and the communities that we represent where a lot of that violence is rooted in, you know, kids were never taught how to address um, conflict without getting physical. And unfortunately that meaning picking up a gun um, or underlying mental illness that leads to suicide. The, the, the Republican Tony Will is carrying a bill that would address it through Operation Ceasefire and focusing on group violence and gang violence. And, but he doesn't understand, and we had this very conversation just two days ago where, where I was trying to explain to him, gang violence is only one piece of firearm violence. And, and a, a program that addresses gang violence does nothing in my community for you know people who are resorting to guns to resolve domestic issues or just garden variety fights or to kill themselves. And so having, it's very important, even as frustrating and as tiring as it can be, it is very important to first say, let me understand where you're coming from and what you're worried about. And I even asked, you know, no one would tell me what was wrong with the, the center that we would create would bring a holistic view looking at um, public safety, bringing public safety and public health and education stakeholders at the state and local government together with community leaders to, to fashion solutions from the ground up. And every time I would ask, what is it you're worried about? I was given this like, well, we're worried that this will lead to gun violence being declared a public health crisis and confiscation of guns. And I'm like, well, number one, it is a public health crisis. But number two, even if I confiscated your gun, that's still not going to get at the root cause. But at least now I understand what they're worried about. So you have to sometimes, even if you violently disagree with somebody, just, 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 and that was probably a poor choice of words, but even if you, if you disagree with somebody, just say, look, let me try to understand where you're coming from so that I can at least speak to you from a place that you will be receptive to listening. And that's very hard to do. So I'll kind of echo what Jeff said, what gives us the fuel to help us do that is knowing that advocates like Moms Demand and Students Demand are in the trenches fighting with us, saying not only do we support you from a policy perspective, but we've got the everyday stories to talk about how this violence is impacting us in our communities and putting a face to it. And that helps us get through. Well, Senator, that, that leads me right into a question we actually have from an audience member. And I think you touched on this a little bit, but, but let's delve into it a little more. You, the, the question is, how do you educate constituents and voters and, and even your colleagues about gun safety policies in the face of misinformation. And I, I think you, what you're talking about is more like a misunderstanding, but we also know there's actual misinformation out there and not just about guns on a lot of issues, but, but certainly around guns, right? This idea that more guns in more places will, will keep us safer, which if that were true, we wouldn't have a 25 times higher gun homicide rate than any pure nation. How, how do you address misinformation? That's a, that's a great question. I, I think 
ways, a couple of ways. Um, one, we have to take the conversation out of the theoretical and into the community. And so um, making sure that we're not just creating a seat at the table for community members impacted by, by guns, but we are taking that policy making table out to them. So taking, you know, the, the delegate that carried this other bill that I was talking about, you know, lives in, in a rural area where they have a very different view of, of guns than in urban communities. So bringing that delegate into an urban community where gun violence is driven by something very different than what he thinks it is and saying, look, just talk to these folks who have been impacted by, by gun violence. The hard part is that requires a certain willingness on his part to actually come into those communities and where he's not willing to then I've got to bring those communities to him. Um, it has gotten a lot harder to do that in the age of social media where in an age of 24 hour you know pick your news channel that will tailor its message to you. Um, I don't know how to combat that but at least with policymakers and my constituents and advocates, it's bringing them together around the table to say, okay, let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve. Let's talk about the reasons for the problem. And then let's frame, is this the right solution to solve that problem? So good morning, what about you? How do you handle either misunderstandings around issues like gun violence prevention or even misinformation? Well, I, I think it's it's doing exactly what Jen said, um, and I may be um, a little uniquely positioned based on what you know. Taking go back to what something Jen said earlier, which is our lived experience. I grew up in one of these rural areas, uh, and so when when my my friends and colleagues on the other side of the aisle talk about the culture of firearms and um, all the rhetoric that they use. I understand that because I saw it growing up. So growing up in Whitfield, Virginia, it's, it was nothing to see trucks in the student parking lot with rifles in their, and the gun racks in the back of their trucks, or you know having kids come in on the first day of hunting season, which sometimes was an excused absence. You know, so, so the cultural aspect and using that lived experience to, to, to tell them and, and sort of try and break down some of the armor that's there and the walls that are there and say, hey, I understand. I grew up in this envi in the environment that you're talking about. And then pivot to kind of, let me tell you about the environment that I represent now and what's what where the gun violence is and what's driving that gun violence or what's driving the poor performance in education or what's driving the level of poverty in our community. Let's or or you know whatever the issue is because oftentimes in those types of conversations, a lot of times um, I've found success in, in those conversations not happening when you're talking about a bill, but it's really in the hallway while you're waiting for something or you're just, you know, in between session and committee or something like that, where, where maybe the, what sparks it is a conversation about a bill earlier in the day or earlier in the week, and you're just having a conversation. There's no votes that are going to be taken. There's no you know, there's there's no gotcha moments. It's just you and that person talking. Um, you can really start to break down some of those barriers, uh, and and it it's it's a slow grind to make that progress um, and break down the, the either misunderstanding or misinformation. Um, but it also requires and and leads to a greater level of trust between and among um, diverse delegates and senators. And delegate Bourne, you talked a little bit about how grassroots movements, volunteers help keep you going. Mm -hmm. We have a question about, does getting out the vote really matter? And I have to laugh because I, I, I know that it does, but can you talk about the importance of having a grassroots base on different issues that can actually hold lawmakers accountable for the votes that they had or for the positions that they have? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, having the grassroots base and, and groups involved 
throughout the entire policymaking, legislative, political process is critical because we need the groups, the people, the faces, the stories to come and testify and be present in, in, in the General Assembly session. But we also need them to go to the, the opponent's town hall meetings and, and, and present those same stories again. We need them to work in the communities that these uh, opponents of, of good, good policy are. And then when it comes time to, to actually vote and be on the ballot, we've got All right, Senator, why don't we move to you and ask you the same question about the importance of grassroots. So I'm sorry, what? Oh, oh, go ahead. I lost you. Okay, so again, we missed you, so we moved on to the Senator. Go I ahead, go ahead. Um, you know, the grassroots organizing is, is incredibly important um, throughout the process. And, and I'll start with the, with the elected, with the elections process. Um, GOTV matters, but first we need grassroots support in getting out the message. Um, and I think that's where you help address misinformation because, you know, campaigns have boiled down to you know, 30 second, if you're lucky and you have enough money, maybe two minutes. Um, commercials, digital ads, um, and, and even in debates, maybe a 60 second answer on a question. But people trust their friends and, and people they know. And so the importance of the grassroots in the campaign process in helping spread information about candidates and and issues and which candidate is better on issues is critically important in, in, in the beginning of the process. And then creating the organization that you can then very quickly turn around to get out that vote, help identify who are the people that are gonna vote for this candidate based on where they stand on the issues and then quickly pivot to now let's get those voters out. Um, and then once the election is over, quickly pivoting that same mobilization to now let's make sure we understand what our candidate is doing once they're in office and we're mobilizing to push uh, other policymakers to, to further that agenda. So I think grassroots organizing in general throughout the process is, is really important and helps combat sort of the, the I don't want to say dumbing down because it's not quite dumbing down, but on a lot of these issues, you can't really educate people in 30 or 60 seconds, but you can educate them in a three to five minute conversation or in some cases, 10 minute conversation at their door. Last question, uh, Senator, let's start with you. What advice do you have for students who want to get involved in, in, in politics or in campaign management or even run for office themselves? So I think first is, is be very honest in your own self-assessment and, and what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. Are you a, a, a candidate type person or are you more a behind the scenes type person? Do you prefer strategy or do you prefer policy? And once you know sort of what your own strengths are, what your weaknesses and what your preferences are, then pursue them. Um, and especially once you've identified what your weaknesses are, surround yourself with people who compliment you so that where you're, where you're weak, they're strong and they help you. Um, and so I think at, you know, when I was at your stage, I, I, you know, I didn't know what level of government I wanted to focus on. I didn't know if I wanted to be a candidate or you know, the policymaker or a bureaucrat or a campaign person. So I got internships and I sort of explored everything until I found what's my passion? What am I good at? And, and then once I decided I do wanna run for office and you know, I could surround myself with, with campaign staff who complimented where I was weak. Um, so I think that's the biggest advice that I would give. Thank you so much, Senator Delegate Bond. 
Um, I would say ditto to that, but I would also, uh, no matter whether you want to be in the management side, the policy side, um, or the candidate side, um, I think it's important to find your why. Um, you know, what are you passionate about? Because campaigns not, aren't necessarily always about electing this person or that person. It could be in many states, there are ballot initiatives in, in, you know, it could be a campaign to raise money for the nonprofit that you love. Um, but they're all have political aspects to them. And so when you find your why and you find your passion, um, I think you're going to work infinitely harder and I think you're going to enjoy the work much, much more. So find your strengths and weaknesses, build a team that complements them, but also find your why. Why are you, why do you want to do this? What are you passionate about and what's going to drive you um, to be the best candidate policy advisor, strategist, um, consultant, whatever the case may be that, that you can be. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. We really appreciate a very helpful discussion. Thank you for having us, and thank you for yeah. everything you do. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you Have all right so much. All bye right. Bye-bye. Okay, so the, the one thing I didn't talk about on here is demand a seat. Um, and, and the reason demand a seat is, is such an important next movement, next uh, moment for our movement is because, you know, we have to have a bench made of policy experts, of people who are passionate about this issue, because yes, it's important to be an activist and be interested in shaping policy, but we also need people who are sitting in elected seats and writing the policy. And, and what I have seen over the last decade is that is sort of an intuitive, organic leap that is made more and more. I mean, I can remember, you know, in the first five years, I would see a, a Google alert pop up and say, oh, so-and-so who volunteers for long-term action is running for town council. So-and-so is running for school board. And we said, wait a minute, why don't we formalize this through a process, through a program within our organization? And we just launched this last year. Um, we've already had hundreds of people go through the program. Many of them are running in this election cycle. Um, demand a seat is open to any Moms Demand Action or Students Demand Action volunteer. You don't have to know where you are going to run. You just know you want to run or you want to be a campaign manager and be more involved in politics. Um, but the great thing about going through the program is, and it's only about a quarter or so long, once you go through it, you have this grassroots army of volunteers to get out the vote, to support you, to knock doors, to serve as what I consider your kitchen table, right? The people who sit around and give you advice and counsel and take on different roles. Um, and so, you know, it, I would strongly encourage if any of you have political aspirations or interested in political campaign management um, to join that program. So just to kind of give you some examples of evolution. First, you know, we've talked a little bit about what has happened at the federal level since 2012. But remember that, that President Obama was in office when the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy had happened. And that Manchin Toomey failed just a few months later. And that in many ways, you know, President Obama had spent a lot of his political capital getting health care through. And so there wasn't a lot more that could be done at a federal level at that point in time. So we did pivot and start working on the state work, but keeping our eye on the fact that there were electoral cycles coming up where we could make a difference. Now, Donald Trump being elected in 2016 was certainly a game changer. This was someone that the NRA had endorsed. It was the first um, early endorsement they had ever done. They spent on record $30 million alone on his campaign. Um, some say that that was more like 60 or $70 million if you actually add up the dark money, um, which obviously we don't know where that all comes from. So the Donald Trump was an NRA darling, but I think what's so important to remember is that even though Donald Trump in his first uh, two years had a Republican House and Senate. So you've got Donald Trump, you've got a Republican House and Senate, and yet he was not able to pass a single piece of the NRA's priority legislation, deregulating sil silencers and something called concealed carry reciprocity which would mean you could take your gun across state lines, um, even in places that had sort of the lowest common denominator for what was required, you know, maybe no permit. And that's the, the NRA's ultimate goal. So the fact that that didn't happen was because there was this incredibly strong grassroots for the first time 
that could play defense. And we did, and we won. Um, in 2018, as I mentioned, the House flipped uh, into the hands of what we call gun sense champions, including uh, our own volunteer, Lucy McBath. She immediately turned around and put forward legislation that passed the House for the first time in decades. Uh, as we know, that was not then passed by the Senate, but it was starting to move the ball forward. And then in 2020, uh, we won the presidency. I was a surrogate for Joe Biden. I was on a campaign trail with Joe Biden. The very last stop before COVID uh, was I was in Columbus, Ohio with now President Biden um, working on this issue and having a press conference. It was something that he was very loud and proud about in part because he had a sea of people in red shirts standing around and supporting him. Um, and then obviously we won the Senate in 2021 by a very, very narrow majority. Uh, and, and we have an election cycle just around the corner. And a lot of people forget about these off year election cycles. It's gonna be incredibly important this year. Um, you know, some of the states as examples, you know, uh, there's so much going on, particularly in red states that I, that I understand is frustrating. For example, you know, we've seen permitless carry pass through several legislatures this legislative cycle. Um, you can undo bad laws, right? You live in a state where bad law passes, it doesn't mean it can't be undone. And so I, I would give Colorado as an example. When I started Moms to Man Action, I lived in Indiana, but I moved to Colorado soon after. And even though I lived in Boulder, which is sort of the, the blue area of Colorado, I can assure you the rest of the state is very red or was very red. And we had a governor in Colorado who passed sweeping gun reform legislation after the mass shooting in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. Uh, it was, he got so much backlash from gun extremists, including the group I told you about, the Rocky Mountain um, Gun Owners Association. And it, it was sort of touch and go around where, what way this, this issue would head in, in part because we didn't hold the Senate. We had the governorship, we had the House, we didn't have the Senate. So we didn't pass any laws after Hicken Looper signed those, into, in, those bills into law. And in fact, what did the NRA do? They turned around and they recalled two lawmakers. So this was sort of ingenious on the NRA's part. Two off-cycle elections, they recalled two lawmakers who voted for Governor Hickenlooper's um, legislation. Not hard to recall a lawmaker. You know, that, that's something certainly we should talk about as a democracy. Just a bunch of petition signatures. Um, they ended up being voted out and, and were recalled. Both of them very valiantly said, you know, there's some things that are worth losing your job over and this vote was one of them. But it taught us an important lesson because we had stayed and fight, fought for that legislation to be passed. But then we sort of left the state once it had happened thinking, okay, we've done our work here. And of course the NRA tried this maneuver again when we passed stronger gun laws in Oregon. They tried to uh, recall several lawmakers. And we had stayed in the state and they weren't able to recall a single one of them, right? So that is, you have to learn a lot of lessons and make sure you're not just playing checkers and nuclear chess. Uh, New Jersey, this is a picture of, of the governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, who has made gun violence prevention one of the tenets of his policy platform. Uh, when I started Moms in Action, Chris Christie was the governor, we couldn't pass anything, even though he was considered a moderate. Um, it was really hard. And now that we have elected, it tells you the importance of an election, now that we've elected Governor Murphy, we are able to pass all kinds of good gun laws. In fact, he's getting ready to uh, do what New York did, which is to pass a law that allows gun manufacturers to be sold, to, to be sued. So PLACA is a federal law that prevents that. They're going to bypass it. New York, you would think we would have a super easy time passing good gun sense laws in New York. The first five years uh, that I had, after I started the organization, New York had a Senate um, a lot of the Democrats were uh, more in the, the pocket of the gun lobby and were not interested in passing laws. We finally undid some of the seats that were standing in our way. Um, and we have now passed some really innovative, amazing laws in the state of New York. Nevada, oh, I mean, I could tell, I could spend the rest of the night, we could go have drinks and I could tell you about Nevada. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in Nevada, we were able to pass background checks. It was then vetoed. We were able to pass it through ballot initiative. The lawmakers refused to um, even put it into law. Uh, they stalled. And so then finally we did it uh, by election. So we went in and we elected a gun sense governor. We elected a completely new general assembly, the first majority female assembly in the country. 
and has passed all kinds of good dentist laws, which makes me happy because I live in California and most of the illegal dents in our state come from Nevada, or at least did when they have beat them laws. And then Virginia, we've talked a lot about Virginia, but I will just say, you know, again, Mark Warner, a Senate senator from the state, voted with the NRA on concealed carry reciprocity when I started Moms in Action. Um, very red state. 2019, we flipped both chambers general assembly. Gun violence prevention was one of the number top three issues. And we have passed over a dozen good gun defense laws. And even though the governor of Virginia opposes us, uh, he hasn't been able to roll any of them back. So next steps, start a student demand action chapter at American University. I'm telling you, if you do that, you will be in the thick of things because we have all kinds of Supreme Court rulings coming down. We have an election cycle coming up. You know, we have, I'm going to the White House for an event tomorrow night. There's all kinds of things happening in DC all the time. So if you're interested in gun violence prevention and in politics, if you had a Students Demand Action chapter here, it would be something that we could certainly plug you into that kind of activity. Um, it is never too early to get involved in this next electoral cycle. You know, if you want to do it through Students Demand Action, great. If you don't, then you can try Vote Save America. Um, there's all kinds of volunteer organizations I have up on the screen that you can sign up for and join, and they will put you to work on the next election cycle. Some, some books that I think are worth looking into, um, David Pluff's book, The Audacity to Win, is, is pretty brilliant. Um, and he really does dissect uh, the Obama years and the Trump years and, and what went wrong and what went right. Uh, the Campaign Manager Running and Winning Local Elections by Catherine Shaw. Again, all politics is local and even more so with an intractable Congress, or Senate, I should say. Right, not much is happening in the Senate. So it's all happening in your city councils and in your school boards and in your state houses. Uh, and then Victory Lab, The Secret Science of Winning Campaigns by Sasha Isenberg. And then follow experts online. You know, they're always talking about this. Um, Ezra Klein just did the most brilliant podcast about local elections and how important they are. Uh, he actually did it with uh, Amanda Littman, who I also list here. And Amanda really works on getting young people to run for office all over the country. And it's just such an important discussion about how it's so frustrating to see people react and decide to give millions and millions of dollars to candidates who can't win, right? We can all think of people who ran for Senate on the Democratic side in the last election in places like Kentucky or other red states that we knew were going to win. And yet they have this huge, huge bank account of millions and millions of dollars that, that really could have made a difference in smaller and local elections where you can win. Um, and then Ashanti Golar is a, actually a good friend of mine, and she runs Emerge America. I'm on the board of Emerge America. It's an organization helping progressive women run down ballot. So Emily's list really focuses on, on sort of the congressional and presidential elections. Emerge America focuses on all of the down ballot races, and they're actually um, structured just like Moms Demand Action. So they have chapters in every single state. Um, they have this, I went through their training in Colorado. It's a really great organization for all ages and it's also something you should consider. So that's it. And I hope uh, everyone will join us in April. I think it's April 8th is, is the next, the 4th. April 4th, thank you, is the next uh, conversation. And we'll be talking about culture and how you change the culture of gun violence, which is the third leg of the stool. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more books coming out. So thank you for joining. Thank you.